So it's the 11th of June, 2022. In this time now, is the time for us to develop this meditation, the Kamatana. So Kama means work, or what we're engaged with. And Tana is basis, so it's the, the basis of our work. Because the mind otherwise it just thinks and proliferates, gives rise to these conditions. And when it's thinking proliferating like this, then it's not at peace. It's full of chaos and disturbance. If we meet with the sensory experience that we like, then the mind proliferates in one way. <coughs> If we meet with one that we don't like, then it proliferates in a different way. But there's always this chaos coming up without respite. And even when we're sleeping, the mind still goes and thinks and proliferates. And so it doesn't come to a state of peace. And when it's lacking peace, then we don't see the truth of nature. And really, nature is revealing to us its truth that it is this way. It is impermanent, it's stressful, it's not self. But with an unpeaceful mind, we simply don't see that. We don't see how it is that way. And so we gain a kind of a knowledge of these things, perhaps, of anicca, dukkha, anatta, but that's just a knowledge, a conventional knowledge, a knowledge that comes from perception or memory. But it's not a direct knowing. It's not a knowing that leads to liberation. It's not a knowing that can free us from our attachments. And so without that, we have the causes for suffering there within us, and the suffering constantly comes up. There's all this confusion and chaos, love and hate and fear that we experience. And so this is why we need to train our minds, and why we need to bring them to a meditation object. And it's a bit hard to do this, because we have these habits of our minds, the habit to proliferate. This habit of self, of attachment, and that leads to the mind being scattered and restless. And this happens when we work, it happens when we study as well. But all throughout our lives, perhaps we've never um, known that all these things that we attach to as self, these things that we believe are me or belong to me, that that's not actually the case. We've never meditated before, perhaps, and so we don't see, we don't understand, wisdom doesn't arise. So the methods that bring about peace of mind, there are many, many of them, and each of these are for bringing the mind to a calm state. So there's the awareness of the breath coming and going, for instance, and we may be aware of these sensations at the stomach area, and so when we breathe in, there's a feeling of expansion in the stomach, and then as the breath, the breath leaves, and then the stomach falls and contracts. So we have a knowledge there, we've got mindfulness there. So we should understand that this and the other methods of samatha coming, they're for the sake of peace of mind and just that. There are these factors of samadhi, vitaka, vichara, um, but these aren't thought they're not proliferation, and rather they're knowledge. It's the initial and sustained application of mind in one object that leads to samadhi, that leads to peace. Initially, kanaka samadhi, and this momentary samadhi. But when we say it's momentary, that doesn't mean that it's just a fraction of a second or a whole second, but it's longer than that. And so perhaps we've experienced this before, a feeling of inner contentment and ease, the heart's at peace, 
And maybe this lasts for five minutes or ten minutes. And then we, through that, we begin to gain an understanding of this path of practice. And perhaps in our lives we've felt joy, at times, happiness. And this may be a really strong sense of joy and happiness, but it's not the kind that comes from peace. It's the kind of joy that comes from gaining something, that comes from having been praised, and gaining status or pleasure. And so there's a happiness there. But it's not the kind of happiness that comes from peace. And perhaps we've never experienced that before. So we need to train these minds to bring them to a single object until they settle into peace, until we're able to abandon all of the scatteredness of mind. So joy arises, happiness arises, of the kind that we've never experienced before. And then we see for ourselves that this happiness, it's a far greater happiness than anything that we've experienced before. And it's a kind of happiness that's able to suppress the defilements. And we get encouragement through feeling that, encouragement to practice further. Once the mind comes out of this peaceful state, then it starts to proliferate again. And that's when we start to contemplate. But now, having had this peace, the mind has energy, it has power, and it can overpower this scatteredness of mind. And so we can use that to contemplate into the teachings of the Buddha. How he taught that all physical and mental things are in constant, and they're changing. And we ask ourselves, is that really true? Is that the case? Before there's a belief in these things, a belief that all physical things, all mental things are inconstant. They're inconstant, they're stressful, they're not self. But we don't yet see that for ourselves. It's a belief that we have in the Buddha, a belief in his awakening, that his heart is pure and bright, the heart of an arahant. And this belief, it's a very good thing. We have this belief, we have this faith and respect within our hearts. And this is something that's, um, that we've inherited from our past actions. We see a Buddha image and we bow down with a heart of faith and respect. And we recollect the goodness, the great qualities of the Buddha his immense kindness and compassion, his purity, his wisdom. That he was able to permanently cut off all the defilements in his heart. He was able to destroy them without having anyone to teach him how to do so. So we have this kind of belief first, and then we practice and we see clearly for ourselves there's this wisdom and vipassana that comes up. And vipassana is a clear seeing into reality. It may be the knowledge that we gain that grows little by little, but then one day it suddenly becomes crystal clear. We see how all things are just conventions. And the mind here is not proliferating, it's not conditioned. We see how all things arise and cease. And it's like we have x-ray vision, and we're able to see into the body, see the nature of decay there, see decaying happening, and seeing all of the unattractive things within the body, seeing it as just being a nest of illnesses. And how these Sankara's conditioned things are frightful. And here, jnana, this knowledge, arises, and there are nine kinds of uh, vipassana, jnanas, that can come up. And seeing clearly into the truth, in a way that we've never seen before. And here there's great contentment of heart, there's happiness, there's joy that comes up. We see the world and how it doesn't have any essence to it. 
There's just arising, persisting, ceasing, and just that. And that no one owns this world. Even this body that we attach to, we believe that we're the owner. You see that that's not really the case. So when even this body doesn't belong to us, then what else in this world could possibly belong to us? That it all just belongs to nature. But having been born, however, we attach to these things as being me and mine, and everything we do is for the sake of me and me gaining things. But there's the cause for suffering that comes up constantly. But we reach one point, however, when we see the state of old age and sickness and death, and how nothing really belongs to us, and how we really do need to train these minds. Because if we don't train them, then they don't become peaceful, and we never gain wisdom. We don't know. Or perhaps we know, but that kind of knowing can't destroy the defilements. So the Buddha, he was an incredible being, a noble being. So may we set our hearts on practicing this noble path that he found, this path that can lead us out of suffering. Have a lot of mindfulness, recite Buddha a lot, chant a lot. Because all the external things, the four requisites, they're all complete already. We have a dwelling, we have clothing, we have food, we have medicines, and these are all complete. They may be coarse or they may be refined, we may have a lot or a little depending upon our spiritual accumulations. But whatever the case, they're enough enough to feel full for the day. The clothes that we have are enough to cover this body and to prevent them from getting hot or cold. And the medicines that we have are enough to reduce the illnesses that we may gain. So with the mind having been born into this body, we use this body to train and to develop goodness. If people are deluded, then they use the body to develop bad things. But for us, we take this body and we use it to chant, to meditate. And this gives rise to the most benefit possible. And we do that before it breaks apart, before this body ends. So we need to train these minds, because a well-trained mind brings happiness. So this opportunity that we have is a very good one. And perhaps we have the chance to ordain for a month, or maybe for a rains retreat. Or the laity have this <coughs> good opportunity to train themselves as well. It's possible for them to see the Dhamma as well, for them to give rise to great amounts of benefit as well. See that for the most part, all of us are very generous already. It's um, relatively easy for people to do this. Even people without virtue, they can be generous as well. But when their wisdom grows, then they'll start being virtuous, they'll start keeping the precepts. So the Buddha taught that the benefits that arise from generosity and virtue is happiness and peace. And a mind that's happy and peaceful is appropriate for the development of samadhi. And this samadhi is something that's a bit tough to do because the mind is so used to proliferating and thinking. And so we don't need to put up a fight, we need to struggle, we need to put in effort, we need to try and try to bring this mind to peace. So we can use the breath to do that, we can contemplate emptiness, We can contemplate the unattractive aspects of the body or reflect upon death. Whatever meditation object works, we use that, we put our effort into that. Seeing the drawbacks, the dangers, 
in the cycle of birth and death, in samsara. And having seen that, then we come to take up this nekama, this renunciation, ordination and practice. And so training in samadhi, this is nekama, this is renunciation. So when Yasa listened to the Dhamma of the Buddha, his mind developed in stages. And firstly, he was taught about generosity and virtue, and those were complete. And then there was happiness that arose within his heart. But he didn't attach to that happiness. He saw these drawbacks of samsara, how being born we must all get old, grow sick, and then die. He also saw the benefits of a mind that's still and peaceful. He saw the benefits of seclusion, the seclusion of the body, physical seclusion and mental seclusion. And this jitta viveka, this mental seclusion, is seclusion from these sense impingements. When we secluded from those, also secluded from love and hate. So there's vitaka, vichara, piti, sukha, ekakada. And as that grows and grows in energy, um, then the mind becomes more and more one pointed and it becomes more secluded. And then when it leaves that state, and then we contemplate, seeing all things as being anicca, dukkha, anatta. And here is where we gain a deeper level of seclusion, seclusion from our attachments, that we destroy all of these attachments. And here's where the wisdom that comes from bhavana arises. Initially, there's a wisdom that comes from listening and then from thinking, but that eventually develops into the wisdom that comes from meditation. And it's a knowledge that we gain that's based upon a heart that's at peace. And perhaps we see a flake of our skin fall, or maybe in our mind's eye we see a strand of hair fall. And we gain a clear understanding into that, and wisdom arises. So may all of you practice until you reach this point. So as Yasa was listening to the Dhamma of the Buddha, then the Buddha came to explain the Four Noble Truths. And his mind was secluded and peaceful. And before he had practiced until the point of jhana, and then he developed that samadhi even further. So may all of you set your hearts, having this good opportunity now, really try to do this practice, really train yourselves in this way, and may you set your hearts on this.